Hello and welcome to The Health Show. I'm your host, Sal DeBella, and today we have a, an interesting guest. His name is Dr. Ger Gerald Pollack, and Dr. Pollack uh, is a researcher on water. He is a bioengineering professor at the University of Washington. He is an author of The Fourth Phase of Water. Welcome, Dr. Pollack. Oh, thank you very much, Sal. Good to be here on your show and uh, happy to uh, talk about uh, water and, and health. Delighted. Oh, great. Now, can uh, you go over, um, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to see your book, but can you, for our viewers, talk about what's in your book? Sure, happy to. Uh, well, the book deals with, with water, um, obviously. It's called The Fourth Phase of Water. Well, you know, we all grow up with uh, the understanding that water has three phases. Uh, we, we have the solid phase of ice and the liquid phase of water that you drink um, and the vapor phase. We found that there's actually a fourth phase. It's not just three phases. Actually, it's a fourth phase. And... And this phase uh, occurs whenever, whenever water meets a surface of some sort, usually a so-called hydrophilic or water-loving surface. That is, it's a, when you have a surface where if you drop the water on the surface, the water spreads out instead of beating up. When it beads up, it's called hydrophobic, the fear, the surface doesn't like the water. But when it's hydrophilic, uh, it loves the water, so the water spreads out. Anyway, that's just a technical term, but, but the point is that whenever water meets a surface like that, its structure changes extraordinarily. You wouldn't even recognize it has completely different properties from liquid water. It's not a solid, but it's not a liquid. It actually has gel-like properties. And there's actually a, a lot of this stuff. So, so that's the first point, is that... <clears throat> There is a fourth phase of water, and uh, uh, we, we call it exclusion zone water or EZ water. And the reason we call it that is because this water is a bit like ice, you know. Uh, ice excludes particles, excludes solutes, and this is, this is similar. It excludes virtually everything, so we call it exclusion zone or EZ, easy to remember, EZ uh, water. So if I refer to EZ or fourth phase, it, it, it's basically the same thing. What's remarkable is uh, that what builds up this phase of water, and that's light. You never think that light would, would be responsible for this sort of thing. You know, we think of light as just illuminating anything, but light is energy, photon energy. And when this energy is absorbed in water, it actually acts to build this fourth phase uh, of water, so um, so that, that that's one point. Another point, which really surprised the hell out of us uh, when we found it, is that this fourth phase is charged. Usually, it's got a negative charge. Water doesn't have any charge. Water is neutral. But this, which the chemical formula uh, is almost certainly H three O two. It's not H two O. It's H three O two. Is negatively charged, and so. So what happens in order to, to build this, this water is that the light comes in and the energy from the light splits the water molecules into negative and positive parts. And the negative part, all these negative parts of water molecules come together to form this fourth phase. And the positive parts just linger in the water as, as protons or hydronium ions, you know, that is, that is a positive uh, proton plus water is hydronium ion. So, so you got a separation of charge. The EZ is negatively charged, and, and uh, the, other, the rest of the water is positively charged, low, low pH. It's like a battery. In other words, you've got a battery in water. So the light comes in, it separates the charge, builds this fourth phase, and essentially, it creates a battery from which energy can be tapped. It's just like photosynthesis. The first step in photosynthesis, I mean, you know, where does, so where did, where did your plant get the energy? Well, you know, the light hits the plant. The plant absorbs the light. And the first step in photosynthesis 
is breaking the water molecules into plus and minus, okay? And, and that's well known. It, it creates a chemical energy which drives everything that the plant does, from metabolism to growth and what have you. What we found is that, is that it's generic, that you and I do the same thing. We absorb the light, and this fourth phase of water that's in our bodies, I neglected to mention that, our cells are filled with this stuff. This is the major component of our cells, is easy water, fourth phase water. And light helps to build this. So, so anyway, th this, is, this is the basics, and, and the, the basics are outlined in the book that I mentioned. And the book goes on to, to describe the uh, implications of, uh, of this stuff. And the implications occur anytime, anytime that water meets uh, 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 some kind of hydrophilic surface, whether it be an extensive surface or a protein surface or a DNA surface or um, some artificial surface. As long as it's hydrophilic, this stuff builds, and it builds massively. So it fills our cells. And, of course, it's got massive implications for health because until now, everybody thought, I mean, we all know that our cells have a lot of water. We're two-thirds water. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you think about the two-thirds, you know, if you think about it in terms of the fraction of our molecules, um, it's a huge fraction because water is small, and to make up that two-thirds water, you need a lot of water molecules. So if you do the calculation or simple arithmetic, it turns out that 95%, sorry, 99%, more than 99% of your molecules and my molecules are water molecules. Amazing. So mm -hmm. water is right at the center of health. It's got to be. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I mean, happy to go on, but maybe you, if you have a question or two, I'm happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Uh, yeah, sure. Our, our body does need water, and it needs, it needs good water. Uh, you look at a plant, it's amazing. Um, if you don't water the plant, it starts to uh, uh, die. I mean, um, Absolutely. So it needs light and it needs water. Um, right. And it needs uh, water every day. Um, and like our bodies, our body needs water. It needs uh, uh, good water. Um, let me see. Uh, I have yeah, some so questions. Let me, can I just respond to sure, that? Sal? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I just want to talk about the water, uh, water issue. So, so there's been a lot of interest in uh, what you're referring to is basically hydration. You know, we, we get dehydrated, and, uh, and when we get uh, dehydrated, we don't, we don't function very well. So, you know, everybody knows you play a couple of rounds of tennis, if you do, <laughs> or soccer, uh, whatever. Right. And, um, you know, after a while, you, you lose a lot of water. And, and then you, you drink some water, <clears throat> and you've got a lot of energy that comes that comes back to you so so why is it uh, that drinking water gives you gives you energy well I mentioned to you that that the water uh, is actually not just h2o but usually it contains some some amount of easy water where the charges are separated plus and minus anybody who studied physics knows that when you <clears throat> when you have separated charges you have potential energy so you're actually drinking potential energy. Excuse me while I <coughs> imbibe myself. Mm. And, uh, and it restores. But the hydration, hydration is so critical. I don't know how many of, of your listeners know the, uh, the book by uh, Batman Galej, otherwise known as Batman. So Batman wrote a, uh, a book. He, he was an Iranian uh, medical doctor, and he was a... He was a supporter of the Shah of Iran, and when the Shah was deposed, he was sent to jail, <laughs> of course, you know, so, uh, and he was the uh, only doctor among a lot of political prisoners, and so, of course, they went to him and said, hey, doc, you know, what do I do? I got this problem, that problem, and what he said was drink water. Well, he had nothing else at his disposal, obviously, <laughs> um, and so he told them to drink a lot of water. He found, remarkably, that drinking uh, water reversed many of those issues and many of those pathologies. And when he got out of prison, finally, he actually stayed in prison longer than he had to because he wanted to finish some studies on, on, on the prisoners. So when he got out, um, he continued with his patients. And the book, which is called uh, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty, <laughs> has sold 
has sold more than a million copies on Amazon. So his son had told me when I met him by chance. And uh, it, it's created, it's a kind of a popular book among a lot of people because it demonstrates chapter by chapter, syndrome by syndrome, you know, diabetes, cancer, what have you, that drinking water is good for your health. And so this, is, this is, has created a, a lot of popular interest in, in the idea of hydration. There's even a hydration foundation that was set up in New York by a friend, uh, Gina Bria. And the foundation is designed to help people understand why hydration is really critical for your health. And, you know, kids, kids know when they're thirsty, they, they drink water. But as you increase in age, your sense of thirst seems to uh, diminish like most other senses. Um, and you don't really know that you're thirsty. So many of us, especially those of us whose hair has turned gray, um, are, are dehydrated. And all we need to do is drink water to, uh, to feel better. So this is a uh, hydration is really important for, uh, for every aspect of your health. So how much, uh, how, how much water would you say that you need uh, uh, per day to drink. Okay, so so this is this is something on which I really have no basis for speculation. You know, I I I'm not a a medical doctor. I'm not practicing. I'm someone who originally studied engineering, and I might call myself a chemist, physicist, biologist. I don't know some combination of the two. Doing many experiments and biology and chemistry and physics over the years, many published stuff, a few books and whatever. But I, you know, obviously I, I don't deal with patients and I can't say to drink six glasses or eight glasses per day. I think the quality of the water is going to make a difference. It, mm -hmm. it, it's not just the amount of water you drink, but the quality of the water that you drink. Well, you know, believe it or not, I haven't, I haven't touched tap water and I'd say maybe 30 years. I only drink bottled water. I don't drink yeah. tap water at all. Um, why, uh, a few times when I went out to eat and I go to a restaurant in certain areas and I, uh, they have the water in front of me and I'm really thirsty for something, you know, I go to take a sip of it and I could taste right away I can yeah. taste the chlorine and the chemicals. You know, when you stay away from, from the chemicals and you <coughs> drink it for the first time, you know, to even take a sip, it's amazing how uh, you taste, you know, all the, um, uh, the negative uh, things that they put in the water. And for that reason, um, uh, I haven't uh, drank tap water uh, yeah. for all these years. Now, I see, I, hear, I see you're drinking water. What type of water do you drink? We drink uh, many types of water. I was just in Mexico, and I had the displeasure of drinking some tap water, and Montezuma oh. got his revenge. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, I deal with water a lot, and also with, uh, you know, we organize international water meetings each year. I'm the main organizer, and I come into contact with a lot of people who produce different kinds of water. Many of those people tout their water as having uh, powerful healing properties. And so, so I chatted with my wife about this, and I told her, look, you know, I really don't want to drink any of these waters because eventually we want to do some tests to see which ones of those waters are really best for your health, which ones can actually reverse pathologies. And if we start, start drinking one of them, then who's going to believe the results of the tests that we do? So I told her, you know, we really should not drink any. And she said, well, you're stupid, she said. She said, that doesn't make any sense. Why don't we just drink all of them? <laughs> so we've been rotating among different kinds of, of waters. And some of these waters, uh, I, I'll tell you the story of, of one of these, um, it's not the one we're drinking right now, but but um, this one really impressed me because I got a call from from a guy about three or four years ago, and he told me I I I produced this kind of water. He said um, in the laboratory he was working with a famous water researcher at Penn State, and when that researcher passed on, the lab closed, and and my friend uh, Steve was 
using the same kind of technology, and they started drinking this water at home. So he called me and said, well, you know, this stuff, my family, we've been drinking it for two years, and we just simply don't get the flu or anything like that. And, okay, big deal. That's not so, so interesting. But he told me that one of the neighbors... One of the neighbors heard about uh, their this kind of water and knew somebody who had irreversible kidney pathology. Okay, on dialysis, on the waiting list for a new new kidney, and wanted to try it. So okay, so she tries it. Thirty days later, he told me on the phone. Thirty days later, there was no kidney pathology. So I said to him, "I don't believe you." But actually, I did. <laughs> and so he sent me the hospital records, and sure enough. To make a long story short, um, he uh, tried it. I invited him to our water meeting, and he, he presented uh, the, what he had, and there were more patients by then. And uh, apparently, um, he's able to actually to reverse kidney pathology with this water. So one about three months ago, someone, someone called me and said, you know, I heard in an interview that you were talking about this water that can reverse irreversible kidney pathology? Well, I've got irreversible kidney pathology. Can you connect me with this guy? So I connected the two. Six weeks later, the guy called me. He said, you saved my life. Oh, wow. the, doctors, the doctors had given me three days to live. That's how bad he was. Blind. He said, not only is his electrolytes back to normal, but he's regaining his sight. So this is just one anecdotal story. What and, was in the water? Well, uh, I know something of what was in the water because they sent me a sample and we checked the sample and the sample contained fourth phase water, easy water. And the sample had been sitting on my desk for three months before I got around to, uh, to checking it. We, we know we can actually measure the amount of easy water by, through the amount of absorption of a certain wavelength of light. It's 270 nanometers, but it's not really so important. And this one had a very strong 270 nanometer absorption. So what they did to produce this water, it's a technical thing. I have some idea. They don't add chlorine or fluoride or something. It's an energetic process that they've, they've patented. And, and so um, I know that it had fourth phase water in it. In fact, I think they're now calling it um, H3O2, which is which is the chemical formula of this fourth phase of what we discovered. And uh, when a guy called me, he said, you know, you saved my life. I, that, that really uh, uh, had a, uh, an impact. I think, I think there are more of these kinds of waters. Uh, the people who make them tout their, their pathology reversing potential. But, you know, it's always difficult to tell because they, they, they're in for profit. You don't know if it's snake oil or right. something real. And right. that's why... That's why we really want to uh, to test these waters in a double-blind, objective fashion. And we can do it, but it's not so easy to uh, gather together. We probably need three, four million dollars to do it. And usually the governmental agencies that support health research, they're, they're more oriented toward pharmaceuticals right. and such and clinical trials. The idea that water might be a kind of wonder drug, that, that's, that's beyond the... the um, sphere of interest of most of these organizations. So we're trying to get the money together to do this. This is so important for humanity. We hear stories of different cultures, the Hunza culture, for example, or people live many years and their water comes from uh, fresh Ganges uh, melt and other, other, other cultures. And we actually found that that glacial melt is rich in in fourth phase water. We found that this phase actually when you if you try to freeze water, you can't freeze, we found, it's in the book, you can't take ordinary water and freeze it. You must go through this fourth phase before it gets to ice. And when you melt ice, it must go through this fourth phase before it turns to water. So this is an absolutely essential phase through which you must go to get there. So when you think about the melting glaciers forming the rivers, the ice melt is actually easy, fourth phase water. And those people in those regions of glacial melt are drinking easy water. We think, based on what we've seen, not proven yet, but a lot of indirect evidence that if you drink this fourth phase water, it's got to be good for your health. It basically replaces the water that's inside your cells. It rehydrates them with the right kind of water. 
So all the proteins can function as they're supposed to function, and all of your uh, functional attributes of your of your cells are working. So there you go. Can you talk a little bit more about this person? Could you mention their name or uh, if they sell the water or uh, that reverse that uh, disease? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, uh, the fellow's name is, uh, who is now marketing uh, the stuff is, is Jeff Harvey, J-E-F-H-A-R-V-E-Y. Um, and the fellow who discovered it is Steve Settlemyer, S-E-D-L-M-A-Y-R. And uh, these, uh, again, I, 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 I don't want to say that this is the only water that uh, is, is good, good for health. It's just that I've seen, in this case, I've seen hospital records that demonstrate such. And on the basis of those hospital records, and also on the basis of my colleague going and interviewing those patients, someone I really trust, I, I think there's something to it. And right. uh, it could be really interesting. So how do you get that water? Uh, do they sell it? Uh, yeah, they sell it. I am not so familiar with So uh, it's online somewhere? Or? Yeah, if you look under H302, I think you can find it. Or look under, um, yeah, I, I think it's probably, uh, you can find it online. I, I'm sure it's online because... Uh, because if you, they're trying to sell the stuff now. Right. And I, I understand that they're actually that it's getting to be in high demand, and they're they're behind schedule in 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 um, in actually supplying uh, the water. So if you look under under Jeff Harvey, J E F Harvey, H A R V E Y H three O two, I think you'll find it. Okay. Oh, that's good. I mean, that is uh, good information uh, for people. Uh, you know, to drink that have a problem that might want to try it. Uh, my, yeah, it my, is possible. My, myself, yeah. I tell you the truth. Uh, when I go to the uh, to the store now to buy water, usually I get water delivered at home. It's the um, uh, Poland Springs uh, water that supposedly reverse osmosis. Uh, but I take a lot of vitamins and nutrients and different things like that. I, I heard that the Poland spring water, uh, that basically takes out everything, reverse osmosis. Uh, so, uh, but I don't care, I'd rather it take everything out. The only thing that I could see that I'm not happy with their water is the plastic uh, containers. Uh, they come in thinner and thinner and thinner, uh, where it's amazing, uh, uh, these companies, uh, I guess they're looking to save money. But the bromine probably uh, that's in the water um, is not that good for you either. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, if I was younger, I would maybe, you know, it, it, this is a funny story. I was in business for a lot of years and uh, I was getting ready to retire. And I spoke to my partner. I said, you know, we should go. This is years ago. I said, we should go into another business. So he said, what business is that? I says, well, you know, maybe we should start selling water. I mean, good water. We have to look for a piece of property that's high up in the mountains and mm -hmm. it has water coming down instead of the polluted water that's on the ground. This from high up, you know, it's coming down and hopefully that's good water. So he says, are you kidding me? Who's going to buy water? Nobody's going to buy water, <laughs> he says to me. So I says, well, you know, it's just, a feeling now, and this is many, many years ago. So uh, look at the industry today. I mean, it's unbelievable. I think if I was younger and I had the um, uh, energy to start another business again, I would go and get the bottled water again. Uh, and uh, the bottled water that I buy uh, in the store now, besides that, water is um, water that ha has been ozonated and has a pH of 9 plus. They sell it in a, um, they, it's getting bigger and bigger in a lot of these uh, supermarkets. And the water, you know, seems, I have an ozonating generator myself uh, and sometimes I ozonate the water myself and, uh, and drink it. Uh, so, uh, that's where I think it's going more and more and more. People are, are paying attention more and more to what they're drinking. 
and it's very important you know it's very important you know you know we um we pay a lot of attention to the food that we eat but we don't pay as much attention to the water we drink and the food is of course mostly water and uh the water is just as important as as the food i just want to make a few comments on what you said you know a lot of companies are making a lot of money selling various waters and if you take out all the minerals as reverse osmosis does it's not clear that that's the optimum uh, for your your health. Um, you know, sometimes they take out the stuff and they put back other minerals to compensate. It's surely a good idea to remove the, the poisons and such, obviously. Uh, I don't think anybody would challenge that. But, but drinking water without minerals might not be the best for your health. Now, you meant water. I think that the... the the idea of a pH, high pH, sounds sounds pretty reasonable because, you know, a high pH means negative charge, a lot of OH groups instead of protons. And uh, if you stick an electrode into one of your cells, it, it's negative. Uh, physiologists have known for years that all cells have uh, negative electrical potentials of, you know, minus 80 or minus 90 millivolts or so. So it makes sense that what you want to do, what you want to do is keep those cells negative. And the evidence that we have, which differs from the mainstream view, is that the reason these cells are negative, they have an abundance of negative charges, is that they're filled with easy water. So it's kind of simple. You know, you have a bag, like a cell, and you fill it with this kind of negatively charged water. And of course, it's negative. <laughs> you put negative stuff in a in in some receptacle, you're going to measure negativity. It's kind of a, you know, you don't need a rocket scientist to, to figure that out. So there's been a lot of research on so-called alkaline water with pH 9, 9.5 and such. And my colleagues in Japan um, have done some research. And one colleague told me that that in Japan, they routinely give alkaline water to patients who have GI issues. In, and it, the government pays for it, so obviously someone has dem demonstrated efficacy of uh, of this water. He told me that they had to do uh, clinical trials, uh, extensive clinical trials, because nobody believed that this water could really help. And it was only after the clinical trials that they came to believe that this was actually money-saving for the government because it cured the people. It helped them. It helped the people with whatever gastrointestinal issue they had. They drank the water and it got better. So now they pay for it instead of paying for complications. So so that's another water um, where there appears to be um, some some good evidence for, uh, for efficacy. So I guess what I want to stress is that there are a lot of waters out there that you can buy. And if you check the internet, you'll find numerous uh, waters. Nobody knows which ones are the best really you can say well you know i i drink this this water that's been that's reverse osmosis and whatever and there are many of them and you can say well alkaline water seems to be a really good one and and the kind that i just mentioned about the kidney reversal would be another one and there are many it, what needs to be done desperately i mean absolutely desperately is some group and and we'd like to do it because we understand water some group really needs to test these waters comparatively to see which ones are good for your health. And, you know, the investment of a few million dollars in something like this is a really modest investment compared to, for example, some of these drug, the clinical trials for drugs, uh, whose side effects we all, we all know are not necessarily negligible. And so water really could be, if you find the right water, water could be the wonder drug of the future. I'm convinced that that's a, a real possibility. And uh, imagine, imagine being able to drink the right kind of water instead instead of taking uh, uh, pills uh, to cure what what ails you. It, it's it's possible. Right. In my book, sixty doctors talk about the cure and prevention of cancer. I have a number of doctors that talk about pH in the water. Uh, and uh, in particular, one stands out in my mind, Dr. Young. He wrote a book called The PH Miracle. And um, between him and other doctors in my book, they, they talk about 
uh, curing cancer and other and diabetes and other illnesses with the high pH, uh, keeping a high pH water in your body, um, uh, because um, supposedly uh, cancer cells can't survive in an atmosphere with a with a high pH. Uh, and there's another doctor that talks about he can cure cancer in two weeks to start the process with high pH uh, in, in the body. Uh, so I, I think there's been a lot of studies out there uh, that these doctors have done, uh, especially I see Dr. Young um, uh, with the pH miracle in his book. Um, about uh, drinking uh, a high pH. Uh, and I, I tell you the truth, I feel much better drinking the nine uh, uh, plus uh, uh, pH uh, than I do. Unfortunately, it comes in a plastic, plastic bottle again. You know, so um, that's why I told my partner, I said, you know, if we were younger, you know, maybe we should make it in bottles, water. And, and I think people would buy it uh, even spend a little bit more money and uh, and buy it without the plastic. Yeah, the plastic might be uh, might be really problematic. Uh, well, the the pH, of course, is 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 very important. Um, and um, I, I can speak from from a basic science uh, point of view, not obviously from a clinical point of view. But I did read a book that influenced me quite a lot. Um, it, it, it's called The Doctor Who Cures Cancer. It was about a guy named Emilio Rivici, who died at age 100 or so, about a decade uh, ago. And Rivici was an immigrant from Romania who went through Paris and then, I think, Mexico and finally came to the U.S. And he did some basic studies with cancer. And uh, it was centered on pH. He discovered in in his experiments done 60, 70 years ago. And by the way, Ravici was important enough to have had audiences with Einstein and such. So he, he was quite a, you know, well, well recognized uh, fellow. He found that the important, um, important issue was pH. He said that when people are sick, especially with cancer, the normal pH values of the body fluids like, like the blood and the saliva and the urine are within very tight ranges, but people who are ill, they vary. Sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're, they're lower. And the critical thing was to get the pH to, to the right value. And if you could do that, not only, not only could you, could you uh, uh, reduce the pain, but also reduce the cancer and the effects of the cancer. And his, he, he was so effective that there was a testimonial on, uh, on the back of, of the book about his life, about the biography, and it said it was written by a guy who had just retired from the Sloan Kettering Cancer <laughs> Institute, so he was the director. So this is a guy, you know, of some esteem, and he says on the back, says, I don't know how he does it, but patients walk into his office dead and come out alive. So, so for me, that was the opening of the uh, the idea, the pH idea that pH was really critical, and um, and so you know we in in the water that I was talking about that I I discuss in the book, I mentioned that the fourth phase water is negative, it's like high pH, and the water beyond is full of protons, it's positive, it has a very low pH, that and and so. So we're very well aware of, of pH. It's actually the water that creates the pH because when you create fourth phase water, there are a lot of protons nearby and actually our body tends to get rid of those protons. We tend to, if you think about it, we tend to get rid of it. We, when you pee, uh, the pH of the urine is very low, so we get rid of protons. When you sweat, the sweat is low pH, so we get rid of protons. When you breathe out, the carbon dioxide and the water together form carbonic acid. The acid has got protons, you get rid of it. So everything we do is designed to get rid of those protons. And we get rid of those protons, we have more negative charge left and higher pH. So absolutely, the, the higher pH is, is, is really important for our health. And that may be why the alkaline water, for example, seems to be uh, pretty effective 
because obviously it's pH, uh, well, uh, eight and a half, nine, whatever, full of negative charge. So this negativity is really important. And um, I mean, I know you had previously um, had uh, someone who talked about earthing or grounding. Yes, and, yes. Uh, as, as good for health. How did you know you, that? I'm curious. <laughs> Well, you told me. Oh, it's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And um, and uh, what happens when you, and I don't remember exactly what was discussed, but I, I know um, from my friend Jim Osman, who did a lot of biophysical research on it, that there's, there's a real basis for it. So you think that, well, you know, you just ground yourself, stick yourself into the neutral earth, and that's fine. But actually, the earth is negatively charged. This is not a fanciful notion that was established 60, 70, 80 years ago, and everybody knew about it. I didn't know about it, but my Russian friend said, how stupid you are, because when he grew up in Moscow, he said every middle school student knew about this. It's not a big secret. Uh, it's, it's very well documented. So when you ground yourself, when you earth yourself, you're sticking yourself into a vast source of negative charge. So what happens is this negative charge gets infused into your body and it fills your cells with negative charge. And if you have some cells that don't have enough negative charge, this fills it back up. And that's why earthing or grounding be so effective, so positive for your health. I remember as a kid, I saw in a newspaper today, a kid buried in the sand somewhere around the Seattle area. He seemed pretty happy. I remember growing up in New York uh, at Brighton Beach being buried in the sand as a kid. It was kind of fun. Right. I never wanted to get out of that. It feels so good to be connected to the earth. And most of us know, you know, you walk barefoot on the beach. It's a wonderful feeling to walk on the beach. And you don't know why it's a, a, a wonderful feeling, but you're connecting yourself to the earth. It's not only natural that we, we do that. Uh, most of us insulate ourselves from the earth with, with the shoes, but, but it's really good for your health. The same thing is true if I might digress for a moment, you go into a sauna, right? right? And it's really hot. You receive all that infrared energy and you come out and you feel like a million dollars. And why, why do you feel so good when you come out? Well, you know, we might think it's a psychological effect and maybe it is partly, but, but you see all this water inside your cell to build fourth phase water, we know from our experiments and it's just detailed in the book that infrared energy absorbed by your body builds easy water. So it does the same thing as the earthing. It restores your cells back to their appropriate negativity or alkalinity, if you will. And that's why it feels good, because it does it to your brain cells, your muscle cells, whatever, whatever cells you, you want to think of. You just feel good when you, when you get out. And you also detox uh, any... Uh heavy metals or, you know, whatever you might have uh, in your body, uh, poisons, well, that, yeah. right? I, I, I can't comment on that. Yeah, I, I, right. I, well, that's yeah. what we spoke about at the last show, how it, um, uh, the, the sauna benefits by getting all that, all that garbage that you have stored uh, in your body and get that out. Um, so, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about, in your view, your opinion, um, uh, the system that we have here for uh, generating water. Other countries uh, took in the ozonated uh, generating, uh, generating the water to get it, um, uh, to purify it. Uh, and we still stay with the same uh, chlorine and all those other chemicals. Um, uh, do you know anything about the uh, ozone uh, generators and uh, did you hear about other countries uh, that are doing this, that started? Well, I know that uh, many of the European uh, countries don't put fluoride in their water and don't chlorinate their water. That's kind of standard in many of the European countries, but here in the U.S. we do. And we've, we've done no studies on, um, on uh, fluoride and chlorine, but all my colleagues who <laughs> who do this uh, tell, tell me that they're poison. Uh, and I don't know their evidence for that, but it's what I hear routinely from uh, almost everybody, and that we're poisoning ourselves by, by drinking this water. Right. You know, in New York also, um, I lived in New York, I lived in Oyster Bay, New York, 
and um, I lived in a community where we had our own water. We had our own pumping station. It was right on a beach where they pump it uh, below uh, going down to the lowest aquastat, you know, to get our water. So supposedly, uh, I was the water commissioner, believe it or not, there. Uh, we, oh. had like, uh, we had like a, um, uh, it, it was a small community uh, where we had a road commissioner, a, um, uh, a water commissioner, and you know, other commissioners that we needed. Uh, so I was the water commissioner, and we had a big tank that the water would be pumped through a very low aquastat, and it would go all the way up to, um, uh, to this tank, and then it would come down to these houses. So um, uh, we never had a problem. Finally, the Board of Health came and says, you know, have you been putting uh, chlorine in the water? Uh, and we basically said no, because before I got there, the, the chlorinator was broken, right? So they, they wanted us to chlorinate the water. So uh, the whole development was against that. So um, we, uh, we checked the water for everything. Uh, it was in a different location in the community. Uh, I think it was every three weeks. And we never had a problem with anything because it was always flowing and flowing and flowing. And the water, even with that, I didn't drink that water, believe it or not. Uh, we cooked with it. Uh, we uh, took a shower with it. Uh, but unfortunately, in my research, when you uh, take a shower in chlorinated water, it's like being in a gas chamber, you know, <laughs> with, that, with that chlorine coming, especially like when I, where I lived in New York, years ago they spoke about hot spots, right? And I was a true believer, wherever the hot spots were, the water was bad. Like in this one particular place where I told you it was a, it was a hot spot, in a restaurant, I went in there and I tasted the water, terrible. What right? do you mean by a hot spot? A uh, hot spot where there was a lot of uh, cancer oh. in that oh. area. Oh. Uh, in other words, say within uh, a mile radius, uh, there was a hot spot where there was breast cancer or other cancers. So um, I really believe that that's the number one thing. I've always believed that. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor. But in my opinion, uh, I believe that that is the number one uh, thing that causes disease, uh, is the bad water with chemicals in it. And in my book I show from, I live here in Massachusetts, uh, there's 60 different chemicals that are in the water and they, and they name each chemical from the uh, Massachusetts um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, so, um, I think the uh, micromagnetic fields in Long Island are bad too. I mean, you have a lot of those overhead power lines in New York. Uh, I think that's another bad thing. I remember reading years ago in the New York State, a New York State book that said that uh, if you're within 200 feet, uh, you have a house within 200 feet, of a uh, electrical line, uh, a high tension line, you're open to a leukemia and other diseases. This came out of the New York State uh, a book, you know. So um, yes, I believe high tension lines um, with micromagnetic fields, I believe the water uh, is bad for you. And a lot of the food we eat with the chemicals that are in the food or another thing that's bad for you. Uh. Yeah, I, I remember uh, the study, I remember reading about it in the New Yorker uh, magazine many years ago uh, about the study of power lines. And, and uh, they did a study and they found that they looked for leukemia and they found that the people who especially were near transformers, which generate a lot of electric fields, were highly susceptible uh, to, to leukemia. And, the farther along the line away from the transformer where you live, the less likelihood 
you had to 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 get leukemia and you know one question is well you know why why is this so why uh, wh what's going on and um so there's a lot of evidence that the water inside you, inside me, inside a glass of water can receive, uh, you might say, information. Uh, and some of that information is, you might say, good information and some is bad. Uh, and I don't want to use the term loosely uh, for those of your listeners who may be physicists or chemists or what, but increasingly there's information that, that there's, there are reports, scientific reports, some really well done. Uh, we, they appear at our annual water meeting that I mentioned that I organized that information can be stored in water. Now I can tell you, uh, and, and if you're near a power line, the kinds of, of information could be sharp transients that are known to be uh, bad for your health. Uh, other information could be good for your health. So, so I start with the, the anecdote that some, some of you may know about uh, Masaru Emoto. I don't know if you know about uh, this fellow. He's a spiritualist. He's become very popular. He's actually coming to our water meeting this year, um, and uh, and if he if he plays music uh, to the water, uh, the water changes. If you try to freeze this water, if he plays pleasant music, you get nice water crystals as it freezes. And if you play hard rock, you get ugly crystals. If you say in a gentle way, "I love you" to the water, you get nice crystals. And if you say, "I hate you," then you get ugly crystals. Of course, you know, this is obviously non-scientific, highly anecdotal. But uh, I think there could be something to it. It needs to be tested, and actually some colleague did test it among naive, um, naive uh, 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 listeners or visualizers to, to say which one is beautiful, which one is, is ugly. And it, it seemed to work out actually in a statistically significant way that there really was something to it. But more than that, um, at our meeting each year has come Luc Montagnier, and I don't know if you know that name. Luc won the Nobel Prize earlier for his discovery of HIV. Well, he's now studying water, and he's studying information in water, okay, information transmission in water. And his stuff is, of course, provocative, but hugely interesting. So I give you one example, something that seems almost unbelievable, but he seems to be demonstrating it. So he puts, um, he puts a glass of water, sealed water, it, no communication with the environment. He puts it next to water containing DNA. And you know the information from DNA is contained in the sequence of the DNA. Each sequence gives different information. So he's got one container with the DNA uh, in it with specific information. And right next to it is it just a container of pure water. They just sit next to each other for a day, okay? Now, and then throw away the DNA, take the water, which he says has been informed with information from the, from the DNA. Now, they're not communicating with us, they're just sitting next to each other, but no communication of molecules or anything like that. So he takes the water that's been informed, and he pours it into um, uh, the powder, the, the, the stuff that you need to make new DNA. And the new DNA has the same sequence of the container that the water was sitting next to. So somehow the water is able to store the information from the DNA sitting near it, not touching it, but sitting near it, take that, store the information, and use that information to produce new DNA. So if, if his experiments can be repeated by others, and I'm told that several others have now repeated it, this is amazing because it shows that it's a glass of water can take in information from from the environment. And so now if you think of the information coming from a power line into the glass of water or into the water in your body, uh, this is really serious stuff because right. it can change the, the content or the structure of the water that's inside your cells in a negative way. And in the same way, it might be possible to put information in your cells that are positive information that can restore the kind of water that you need inside your cells. So, so this is, uh, some people would call this a fringe area because it seems like hocus pocus. But I've now seen enough evidence in the literature, sound evidence from, from serious scientists with the right methods, carefully done, double-blind experiments that demonstrate that this seems to be possible. So this is the frontier in the future. Yeah. That's so very interesting, yeah.
Yeah, it's interesting. It kind of reminds me about the shower that you take because if you have to take a shower with you know with all the pollutants and all the junk in in the water, this stuff is absorbed in your body. So it's not just you know it's not just hey I feel great after the shower, but Absolutely. some of the stuff in the shower becomes part of you. Absolutely, it's almost like drinking it. Absolutely. Now I'm in a place now that it's well water with no nothing in it. You know, just well water. So uh, let, let me say a few things about well water. You know, if the water comes deep, from deep under the ground. Um, so w we found that this fourth phase of water is actually built um, by pressure. You know, and the deep water is under a lot of pressure because you got a lot of stuff above it that's pressing down on it. And so the water coming from down usually is filled with minerals. It's not reverse osmosis water, and it's subject to pressure. If that, and under those conditions, we expect that some of the water from the deep aquifers, maybe your well, I'm not sure, should be should have a lot of easy water, and that that water may be really good for your health. Uh, of course, it needs to be tested for bacteria and such, but right. uh, it might be very good for your health because of those reasons. Is there other other ways of uh, testing to see if it's easy water? Um, the, the main test, it's actually a pretty simple test. It's not complicated at all. Any chemistry laboratory uh, has a spectrometer. It's so-called UV vis spectrometer. Um, it's not that expensive. You just put the water into a little container and put it in the light beam and it tells you uh, which wavelengths uh, are getting absorbed. And um, colleagues of mine have been looking at various well waters, spring waters, and Quite routinely, they find, especially up in the mountains, uh, they find that this water has this a big peak at 270 nanometers, which means that it's got a lot of easy fourth phase water in it. So, you know, again, there are a lot of ifs, ands, and buts. Being a scientist, I, I, I've got to tell you that, that um, uh, we think that this water should be very good for your health, but the evidence is not completely in yet. There are many good reasons to think that. Uh, it still needs to be tested, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, getting back to what we were talking about, the micromagnetic fields, <clears throat> I have in my book all about that. But um, as a, I'm also a health coach. I don't know if I mentioned that to you. And what I do with uh, someone that has disease <clears throat> is I go to their house with a meter. And I check, especially if they have a line, an outside line, coming to their house and going down the side of their house. You know, because if the insulation is worn, the meter will pick that up. And if it's over 2.0, you're at risk. Uh, and if you're in that atmosphere for, uh, say, you have a bed near there, that you sleep right alongside of it. Uh, you're open to maybe uh, a problem, you know, if it's more than 2.0, okay? So, um, 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 now, uh, with these lines coming down, the utility company, if, uh, if I find that it's, say, more than 2.0, they will come and they'll um, basically um, uh, change or... or redo the insulation because they know it's not supposed to be going into the house. But another interesting thing that I have in the book, unfortunately I went out uh, a few years back and I bought two hybrid cars. Now hybrid cars, believe it or not, uh, in the book, the, the research shows that um, the micromagnetic field in there, especially for children in the back seat, is bad if you go on long, long trips, you know, because you have those high voltage batteries that are in the back that probably uh, the, uh, is under the back seat or behind the back seat, and uh, they claim in the research that that's not good, especially for children that uh, that are young with a hybrid car. So I think uh, I have to reassess the cars I have, because I do travel to New York uh, pretty often. So, and that's a, a four or five hour trip. So, um, you know, I don't know, I have to get my meter and go out there and take mm -hmm. a look, because just like a microwave, 
if you take it the meter and you go closer to the microwave, it'll go to four or five hundred, the numbers. If you stand back like three feet, it'll be within the range. So you have to be three feet back, you know, from the microwave uh, oven. Uh, so I haven't really checked the, the car yet, uh, but I'm going to do that shortly and, uh, you know, and, and tell the viewers, you know, what yeah, I found. You, you, got a, you got a point there. Um, you know, magnetic fields um, and electric fields too, uh, definitely they all play roles in water. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that the most, I guess the most, there are two pieces of dramatic evidence that you can see. Uh, again, mentioned in my book, uh, there's a Japanese investigator who takes a trough of water, he puts a magnet behind it, a powerful magnet, he turns it on, and by the way, he dyes the water red. Uh, why does he dye the, wa dye the water red? Because when he turns on the magnet, the water splits. It's like the Red Sea has split, and you can walk right through. And it's amazing because the water splits into, um, into two parts, and right in the middle, you can just turn on the magnetic field, the water splits, and you can actually walk across. It's dry, completely dry. And so that the first indication that, hey, you know, maybe uh, uh, this, this uh, legend really, really could have happened with a strong magnetic field. And the second is, um, there's a, a guy named uh, Andre Geim. Uh, you probably don't know the name, G-E-I-M. And Andre, I invited him to our water meeting once because he had some pretty dramatic results. Uh, it turned out, he told me he can't, he can't come because he changed fields. What field is he in, in now? He was doing magnetic fields. Um, he was actually, he was lifting mice, put a mouse in the magnetic field and the, the mouse would levitate. Right, and this was kind of an amusing observation. I thought that the and someone else in Japan can confirm that rats can levitate too. They just put them in a powerful magnetic field and they rise up. So obviously, animals are reacting in a in a, uh, a, a shocking way to to um, a dramatic way to to magnetic fields. And and he also showed that if you put a glass of water there, the water would lift up too. So so water. There's no doubt that that water and water in your body too responds. The the final part of the story about Andre Geim, he told me he changed fields. I didn't know what field he changed to. It turned out he was in the field of graphene and the next few months he won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so so I guess, you know, the fact that he declined to come to our water meeting because he was too busy, we give him some justification for having him change fields into something less interesting. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that that you know you need no more evidence than this dramatic kind of evidence that that magnetic fields can have a really powerful effect on water and since your body is mostly water 99 percent of your molecules you have to be concerned whether these effects are going to be positive or negative very important right absolutely well right. we're coming to a close we're running out of time could you just um uh, uh is there anything that you want to speak about that we haven't touched on? Uh, well, I, I, I guess uh, I'd just like to put in a plug for my book, The Fourth Phase of Water, because it, the, book have, the book has been very popular. It's received, received a lot of uh, accolades and such, and, and uh, it really tells all about water. This, this discovery of the fourth phase of water, the, the, the uncovering of this fourth phase, which actually had been proposed a hundred years ago, it's not really new, gives a full understanding of so many issues can, uh, um, surrounding water that have not been understood in the past. And so I, I welcome any of the intellectually curious, this is actually written for the layperson, it's not written for scientists, it's got lots of cartoons and and one reviewer said it reads like a children's book <laughs> uh, because of all the cartoons and such. So I would encourage looking at the book because it, it just opens so many doors to understanding, including understanding health. Well, I thank you so much. It was an honor to have you on our show. And uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. If you sure, happy willing. to. That, uh, thank you for the interesting questions. Oh, okay. you're quite welcome. 
uh, thank you for uh, viewing our show, and um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you.